Welcome to the Humans Under Grace Bible Study Podcast. We're getting ready to have an old-fashioned, line-on-line, precept-on-precept study of God's Word to search out those deeper truths and gain a greater understanding of the Bible. We would love for you to join us today as we dig in and learn what it is that God would truly have us to understand from the letter that He wrote to us. Hello there, and God bless you. Welcome into the study today. We're glad to have you. We are going to be carrying on with Matthew, with the great book of Matthew, chapter 4 and verse 1. Now, where we left off in our last study is that Christ went to John. He met John in the Jordan, and reluctantly, John baptized him. He didn't really, you know, he felt that he wasn't of the highest of caliber to be baptizing the Messiah, it should have been the other way around. But Christ insisted and because it was it it was to show us and to teach us of the obedience and also at the baptism, that spirit, that dove lighted down on Christ, and that voice of God proved to the world, came out as a witness that this was the Messiah. This man was the Messiah, God in the flesh. Now, he's about to go into the temptation. And, you know, if you want to know, if you want to understand how it is that Satan's going to come after you, this is where it's at. This shows Satan's playbook right here. This is his M.O. in these these temptations that he goes against Christ. And also, you can refer back to the book of Genesis and see these same temptations, in a a sense, but they weren't, they, they failed in that one. Obviously, Christ does not fail. So we ask for clarity and understanding from our Father. In Jesus' name, we're going to pick it up, chapter 4 and verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, he's in the wilderness to be tempted. As I mentioned, Genesis, the first man, Adam, was tempted in the garden, and then he was cast out. Christ is tempted in the wilderness. And then he will have his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, where that's the the final garden, if you will, before he is crucified. Verse 2, And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now, forty in biblical numerics is probation. You've got forty days and forty nights here of Christ being tempted, the 40 days and 40 nights of rain, the 40 years of, of the Hebrews or Israel roaming in the wilderness before they got into the promised land. And what this did is it weakened his flesh. Now, this is a very important thing because Satan knows that. He sees that his flesh is weak and he knows our weaknesses. And this is what he's fixing to come after. Verse 3, And when the tempter came to him, just he, he went to Adam and Eve too. You ain't got to search him out. He'll find you. He said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made of bread. He knew he was hungry. So now he's trying to get that that weakness, that flesh, to be tempted. Verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. This is Satan quoting scripture. That ought to get your ears a little perked up here. You know, because we know he's the liar, the deceiver. And how is he going to do with this scripture? For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. That comes from Psalms chapter 91, verse 11 and 12. We're going to go over there right quick, just to see exactly how how close he quoted that, if he got it spot on, or if he does what he usually does and twists a little deception in there. Psalms chapter 91 Verse 11, For he shall give his angels charge over thee, starting off good, to keep thee in all thy ways. Well, now, he didn't say that. 
And why is that important? Because to have God's angels have charge over you, that means basically that's God saying, this is my anointed one and the devil cannot touch you. Remember in Revelation, he said, touch not mine anointed. Not, that, that does not have the seal of God in their forehead. So if you're doing what's righteous, you're trying to do what's right. You're trying to study, you're trying to follow God's word, search out his will. That's keeping you in all your ways. Verse 12, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest, that, lest they, thou dash thy foot against a stone. It don't say at any time. That was Satan saying, oh, well, he's given all, charge over his, his angels to watch over you. So you can do whatever you want to, and they're not going to let anything happen to you. No, that's not true. If you're doing what is righteous, because we all slip, we all stumble, we're all tempted. But if we keep our eyes on God, and when we do stumble, when we do slip, his angels are there to minister to us, to strengthen our spirit, and get us back up on the path. Now back over in Matthew chapter 4. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Verse 8, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now, see, this is a little different from with the Genesis case, with Adam and Eve. And the reason why I say that is because here, first Satan went after their flesh, went after Christ's flesh. You're hungry. Here, turn these stones into bread. And then he went after the spirit. Now, in Genesis, when he went after the flesh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, he said, you, you, you won't surely die. Talking to Eve, if, if you happen to eat this fruit, you're not going to die. Well, that'll make your flesh feel pretty good. Huh, no death, all right. So then he takes Christ to the temple, and he says, jump off of here, and the angels will pick you up. They're not going to let you fall. That's that divine, that spiritual temptation here. Whereas in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, he said, you're not going to die, but you'll be his gods. You'll know everything. Tempting on that level. Obviously, we know the Genesis story, and that's as far as they made it. They fell at that point. Christ was still strong. So now you get to this point where the devil's saying, just fall down and worship me. I'll give you anything you want. Just fall down and worship me. He didn't have to say that to them. But Christ is the perfect man. Verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That's from Deuteronomy 11, verse 3 and 4. Verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now he didn't dash his foot, but he was hungry. Verse 12. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed unto Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the, Is, Isaiah the prophet, which is Isaiah, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And that's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Verse 17. From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or it's near. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, now Peter is, in the Greek, is Petros, and that is a rock. And Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And they, this was their livelihood, this was their job. They were, it's not just they were out there 
fishing for themselves. They were, they were commercial fishermen. 19, and he said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now you notice he didn't, well, let's, let's go to verse 20. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. All right. So you notice here, he didn't have a revival. He didn't walk up and say, hey, let me talk to you a little bit. Have you heard the good news? He didn't beat around the bush. He just walked up and said, follow me. Now, why could he have done this? Because he knew Peter and Andrew from the, from the, first, from the first eon, the first world age, okay? Then before Satan fell. And this shows of that presence of the elect or those who are predestined. Now, how can we say anything about that? If you look at Ephesians chapter 1, flip over there and, well, I don't misquote this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. To understand the first few chapters of Ephesians, you have to understand that there was a time before this flesh age that we're in. And we were all created at the same time. And in that time, we were in our spiritual bodies. And that was before the downfall of Satan. At the downfall of Satan, everything became void and without form, right? And then that's why we're here now in the flesh. Because God caused us to move through the flesh to prove whether we love him or not. So basically wiped our minds and put us in the flesh. With that, you have majority of the flesh have free will. They can choose God. They can choose not to worship God. They choose whatever they want. I mean, they don't, they don't have to do anything. It's, it's their own free will. But there are, the, are those, that remnant, that little group of those who are predestined, such as Paul. And it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. This word foundation is kathabo in the Greek, and it means the overthrow. Now, what overthrow would we be speaking of? The overthrow of Satan's rebellion. He chose us before that. And why would that be? It's because those who are predestined, who are the elect, who are going to stand against Satan at his appearance as Antichrist, were chosen then because they stood up against him at that point in time. Now, this world is the cosmos. So, just the, the time of that, in, the, of that entire age back then is what that's meaning. He chose us way back then. There's more. You can go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah was another who was chosen. The reason why I call Paul out is because, if you remember, he was on the road to Damascus and he was, had a letter in his pocket to do whatever he wanted to persecute all the Christians he could find. And he was struck down by Christ. And he said, why are you, why are you persecuting me? Why are you kicking against the pricks? And he blinded him. And then he said, you are a chosen vessel. And he became the Apostle Paul at that point. And the only reason that that came to pass is because Paul was a chosen vessel. He was predestined to be who he became. He was a great, he was a great scholar, studied at the feet of Gamiel, and um, he was very well educated. He just missed the point that Christ was the Messiah. That, that's all. And so in that, just as God gives the angels the charge over us in that and that he had predestined or chosen Paul in the first world age, then at that point he could go in and go, whoa, hold on, you're going over here. This is not where you need to be. You need to be over here. And that's when he was struck down and became the Christian of Christians, if you will. Now, Jeremiah is another example of predestination. We'll Pick it up in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. Now, this Anathoth is a, a town of priests, or kind of just 
basically everybody there was a priest. And it's about three miles northeast of Jerusalem. Verse 2, To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. Now this Josiah, he was a righteous king. He cleaned up the house of God. They, they had practiced idolatry and all kind of just fornications and everything in the house of God. And he came in and cleaned it up and actually found scrolls that were the scrolls of the law, okay, the Torah. And he was trying to, you know, he was one that pushed to learn these again. Verse 3, it came also in the days of, Je uh, of Jehoiakim, the son of Jos Josiah, king of Judah, at the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. Verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before, they came, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. He had chosen Jeremiah in that first earth age, or that first world age, before the overthrow of Satan. Verse 6, Then said I, Ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Or, or not necessarily a child, but younger. He was believed to be around 19 to 21-ish at this point. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Now, if you look at this, this is an example of Matthew, of, of excuse me, of, of Mark 13, where we are called up before the Antichrist and are supposed to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us. And that's God giving us those words. So this is an example of that for us, that whoever the elect are at that point, they don't have a choice. They are predestined to be at that specific area in that specific time to allow God to speak through them. Eight, Verse 8, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Let's go on one more verse. Then the Lord put, his, uh, put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So you see, this is the reason why I call this out about the predestination is because it is crucial to understand that in how Christ picked his disciples. Each one of them were chosen for a specific reason. That being they stood against Satan in that first time. Now, back in Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to be picking it back up in verse 21. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a ship, with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. Now you notice these are more fishers. And the reason for that is the, I guess the metaphor of the fishers for men is because whenever you're fishing, you don't just sit, you don't, you don't run all kind of hooks and all kind of stuff out there and just jerk and maybe you'll get something. You throw your lure out there, you throw your bait out, and you just kind of jig it around this way and kind of finesse it around that way. And you lure the fish in. So you throw them, you, you put a worm out there and lure them in until you catch one. And that's the same thing with this word. You drop a seed and you get that interest sparked. And then I'd say lure them in, but, but you get them interested and get them coming to the word. And then you can teach them the word. You don't just go out there and slap them in the head with a Bible. That'll get more running away from you. And he called them. Verse 22. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness 
all manner and, and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought him uh, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy and he healed them. Now notice that they that it's called out here that it wasn't just all the diseases were of devils. No, they were different. They were diseases and they were those who were possessed and they were those who were lunatic. Now this word lunatic, what this is, is of the lunar. So prophecies of the moon or in months or lunar prophecies have to do with Satan. And what this is saying is that there were some that were possessed with devils. And then there were some who were lunatic, who were a step above, just like the one that the apostles couldn't cast out the demon. He was he was a little stronger. You had to have a little stronger faith. And that's why the apostles couldn't quite get that one. But Christ said, be gone. And he was out of there. Verse 25. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. Chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came upon unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor of, in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Now, this blessed is happy. Happy are they. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the truth, or the, uh, the, the earth. Blessed are they which do no hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Rejoice. Oh, excuse me, verse 11. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Looking around the world today, this... Looks like it's ramping up a little bit. The Christian community is constantly under attack by all different beliefs. Verse 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And, you know, that's the thing. A lot of people say, well, you know, I wish I, I, I would like to be a prophet. I would want to be, you know, one of the disciples. I would want to be this and want to be that. If you do your research, they didn't, their lives did not end very peacefully. Jeremiah made it out. Isaiah was cut in half in a tree. The disciples, they were tortured brutally. It was a hard, hard life. Verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its flavor, its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So we're supposed to add the flavor into the world. We're supposed to give that sprinkling of this word to make this world better. You ever had a... a a dish that didn't have any salt on it is just bland. It's just, just there, just kind of taking up space on the plate. Well, that's why we're supposed to be the salt. And we're supposed to have flavor, and that flavor is we're supposed to be able to understand and to be able to give this word, to give the meat, the meat and the milk of this word. That way, we enrich the lives of those around us with this flavor. Verse fourteen. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, 
and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. What that's saying is whenever you come into knowledge, whenever you learn something from this word, don't hide it. Don't just press it down. You've been given that knowledge for a reason. It's a gift from God. And share it. Allow that light to, to light the room, to brighten others' days, and to brighten their path that way they can see the true path that they should be walking on. Verse 16, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Meaning, don't, don't take any credit for it because it's the Spirit. It's that Spirit that God gave you and it's God's blessings. So, whenever they say, man, how are you so happy? Or how this or how that? It's, oh God. God takes care of me. My Father in heaven has blessed me. Verse 17, Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now this right here is something that is very, very important to understand. Because many will teach that now that Christ has come and he died on the cross and he gives salvation, and he does, that is absolutely, absolutely what happened. Then they say, well, then the, the law, that's the Old Testament. Now we're in the New Testament and the law doesn't apply anymore, but it does. You can't murder. You still can't kill. You're not allowed to steal. You're not supposed to do any of the Ten Commandments. You think about the Ten Commandments. That's the law. And I say, well, that's the Ten Commandments. You know, we'll, we just keep it right there. No, that's the law. And we're still supposed to abide by the law. Now, where it changed was in the ordinances, such as the slaying of the lamb or the, the heifers and those sacrifices, the ceremonial laws. All those are done away with because Christ nailed them to the cross. They were nailed to the cross with Christ because he was that perfect sacrifice. Whereas now, if you decide to sacrifice, you're saying Christ wasn't worthy. But this cow out here is. That's where it changed, not in the commandments, but in the ceremonial stuff. Verse 19, Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So don't misteach this word. Don't go out here and, as it would say in Ezekiel chapter 13, speak of their own hearts, the prophets that spoke of their own hearts, and God said nothing to them. Don't tickle the ears. Bring this word straight forward. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, these scribes and Pharisees, We'll see, they're the ones that nailed Christ to the cross. They are far from righteous. They are the, 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 the salt with no savor. And a matter of fact, Christ called it out, and I believe in the last study we called it out, that they were the, the, son, the children of the devil, the generation of vipers, those offspring of the serpent. So, who were they worshiping? Not Christ. Because Christ said, if you knew my father, you would know my words. And even Abraham was excited to see the day of my coming. And they argued him the whole way. Verse 21. Ye have heard that it is said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be endangered of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. 
Now, whenever it's saying thou fool, this in the Greek is moros. And it, what it means is, basically means you're, you're completely empty of all spiritual or divine knowledge. It means you have absolutely no hope. And it's like judging somebody. Judging them to hell. To say, to say thou fool in this sense is to say, well, you're just a lost cause. Nobody's a lost cause. Not in the flesh today. And the reason for that is because Christ can forgive all sins. So to judge somebody, we're not the judge. That's stepping on God's, that's getting in his area. And it's best to leave that to him. Now we'll pick it up in verse 23 in the next study. God bless you and y'all have a great day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Humans Under Grace Bible Study Podcast. If you have any questions that you'd like to be answered on the podcast, you can email us at questions at humansundergrace.com or you can write to us at Humans Under Grace, P.O. Box 1467, Tatum, Texas 75691. Thank you and God bless you.